Well, so I, I've talked a lot about, it's kind of loud, isn't it? Is it too loud? Just right. It's just right. Okay. Um, Ricci curvature is a subject I've talked a lot about in recent years. Um, maybe most of you have actually heard the talk already, but um, there's one person at least I'm pretty sure hasn't heard it, and that's Jim. <laughs> It's a safe, safe assumption. And since he's the one who uh, taught me about Ricci curvature in the first place, I feel I can give it at least one more time. Um, so this is particularly concerned with manifolds um, and later by generalization spaces whose Ricci curvature has a definite lower bound. Okay. So the upper bound I won't worry about, although it plays some role in the subject afterwards, but not so much just by itself. Right. So I want to study these. Um, I fixed the lower bound. I want to study what such spaces look like on a, on a small scale. And uh, where the small scale part comes in uh, is easily seen. And I'll say that in a minute. So what I'm going to talk about um, is joint work with uh, Toby Colby. So let me begin by reminding you what is Ricci curvature. So one way to think about it, it's a function, so this, so we have a Riemannian manifold and the Ricci curvature I can think of as a function on the unit sphere. Um, that's one way of thinking of it and what's the function? I take a vector on the unit sphere uh, a unit vector, that is, I extend it to an orthonormal basis in some fashion. I consider the plane sections, n minus one of them, that uh, you get spanned by x and the other uh, basis vectors. I take the sectional curvatures, add them up, and that's a number and I assign it to x. Now, it turns out that that's independent of the way that you extend x to an orthonormal basis, and that's because the underlying object is really a symmetric bilinear form, a function of arbitrary vectors x and y, and then um, the, the expression for that symmetric bilinear form is actually gotten by taking the full curvature tensor and taking a trace, Contra that is taking a contraction. So that's when you take a contraction, it's independent of uh, how you choose your orthonormal basis because it's taking a trace. So the Ricci curvature is actually a symmetric bilinear form. And this, I think, uh, accounts for its particular significance because um, it's an object of the same type as the metric itself. And by the way, I might add parenthetically, um, this was a fact whose significance was not lost on Jim, who many, many years ago uh, always said one should deform the metric in the direction of the Ricci tensor. And or maybe minus the Ricci tensor and good things would happen. Um, so we want to look at 
the case where the Ricci tensor is bounded below by a definite multiple of the metric, so technically we should write Ricci bigger than or equal to n minus 1 h, where h is some definite constant, times g, but for short we'll just omit the metric and write n minus 1 h, and shortly we'll make a further normalization that will get rid of h. So, so we could so what, what the, it's a kind of average sectional curvature just uh, by the formula I wrote down and the kind of questions I'm going to ask uh, could be asked in many other contexts. Uh, the crucial thing is somehow uh, how things scale so I'm going to pursue this discussion in the context of Ricci curvature but it would make equally good sense to pursue it with other uh, controls on the curvature and indeed the case sectional curvature having a definite lower bound, say minus one, this uh, is what was done uh, and later made abstract in the work of Borago, Gromov, and Perelman on the so-called Alexandrov spaces. So now we want to say fix the lower bound and then study on a small but definite scale. So why do I say that? Um, if I just say the Ricci curvature has a definite lower bound, uh, for example, if the manifold were compact, then up to scaling, I could always achieve that no matter what I started with. So it's not just by rescaling the metric, right? You make the manifold bigger, the absolute Ricci curvature gets closer to zero. And so uh, I, would have, I could have started with almost anything and after rescaling it, which doesn't change its essential properties, uh, I would achieve this definite lower bound and therefore I couldn't hope to say anything uh, interesting, right, because I started with something general. So if, however, you do it in the opposite order, namely you make the normalization, no matter what you started with, you rescale it so you're sure you have at least this definite lower bound, which is the Ricci curvature of hyperbolic space, so it's just a normalization. Then, once you've done it, uh, for the moment you can't scale it anymore, so if you look now on a very small scale, you might hope to observe something interesting, right? Like we know the manifold on a sufficiently small scale, no matter what it is, will look like Euclidean space. The question is how small a scale do we have to go to before that occurs? And so this is the general reason why the problem makes sense in this formulation. So you hope to observe something uh, that's A, interesting, and B, that you can understand. So before going on, let me recall the control over the geometry that a lower bound on the Ricci curvature uh, exerts. And the most basic control is the so-called Bishop-Gromov inequality, which is like a, a doubling condition in the context of measures theory. So it's, it gives a lower bound for the ratio of volumes of a pair of concentric balls. Okay. Namely, it says, in your manifold, that ratio for a pair of concentric balls is bounded below by the corresponding ratio in hyperbolic space, or in the model space, simply connected constant curvature. With the given lower bound on curvature, the corresponding ratio, same radii. Okay? So what this means, in effect, is if you put the denominator over there, on the right-hand side, by cross-multiplying, it says that the volume of the smaller ball of radius R1 can't be too small, right? Once you know you have a definite amount of volume on the ball R2, now you move inwards, it can't suddenly go away. There's still a definite amount of volume there. That's what this tells you. Okay. So this uh, is a condition which plays a role in analysis, it makes sense, for, let's say, for a metric space with, with a measure, uh, where it's called a doubling condition and has been studied by uh, analysts who study metric measure spaces. It's known to, in that context, to be a very significant condition. For example, it implies that the Vitali covering theorem holds. Okay. Now, actually, the doubling condition is a kind of integrated form. It's not the most basic uh, version of this. So in particular, not only do you have this kind of comparison of volume forms, relative ratios of volume forms, but it holds in every di direction. So it's really something that holds along every geodesic. If you write the 
volume element in polar coordinates, the corresponding inequality is true. So if, you, if this represents the thing which in Euclidean, say if the lower bound were zero, this would be r to the n minus one, and this would be the area element in your manifold, and then along a geodesic, that ratio is just a decreasing function of r, is what um, it says to have the lower bound on Ricci curvature. Uh, in this formulation, it's also not the most basic formulation. We know that the variation of area is given by mean curvature, and the mean curvature of a distance sphere is actually essentially the same thing, once you make it into a number, as the Laplacian of the distance function. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in Euclidean space, the mean curvature of a sphere of radius r is n minus 1 over r, and the Laplacian you think of the formula for Laplacian and polar coordinates of the distance function from a point r, the r variable in polar coordinates, is also n minus 1 over r. So that's in Euclidean space. And in fact, um, you have the, 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 the basic uh, assertion is that this is true in a Riemannian manifold. The real comparison is between the mean curvature of distance spheres and that in the model space, model meaning the constant curvature and dimensional space, which is lower bound for your Ricci curvature. So, or you can say the corresponding comparison of mean curvatures of distance spheres, which then you integrate, uh, use the first variation formula to get back to the previous statement. And the fundamental fact emphasized by uh, Kalabi was that uh, this is true, this has a sense, first of all, and is true everywhere, even on the cut locus. So the distance function on a Riemannian manifold, it's only smooth almost everywhere. For example, even on a circle, it's not smooth at the origin, of course, but also not at the antipodal point. But it is smooth almost everywhere. It's smooth everywhere else. And the point is that if you understand Laplacian, for example, in the distribution sense, or in what's sometimes called the barrier of viscosity sense, um, the inequality, the comparison that says that Laplacian of R is bounded from above by the quantity uh, which you get on the nose in the model space, this has a sense even on the cut locus, and moreover, it's true. It extends to the cut locus. And this is of crucial importance in the applications because you can't control where the cut locus is, and uh, even if you knew where it is, if, I mean, it might be there. So the point that this is true in a generalized sense, and on the other hand, the distance functions are the only natural functions, or the most natural, let's say, that you have in a metric space, you want to be able to take Laplacians of the natural functions, even though they're not smooth, and have a meaningful true statement. And so this is a crucial um, observation, um, which is used in it's true in a sense that allows you to use the maximum principle as if the function were smooth. That's the main point. Okay. So these are the basic ways in which bounding Ricci curvature from below controls the geometry. And now I'd like to give some more descriptive uh, discussion of where what you can uh, conclude eventually using these tools and, and some other ideas. So. The basic idea is the idea of rescaling, which is, of course, a completely general and pervasive idea in science, and fundamental nonetheless. Um, the, the point is to be able to implement it. So recall now that we normalize the Ricci curvature once and for all. So we have to be kind of clear in our mind about what we're doing. And then, having normalized it, we agree to study small balls. And we try to say, that we hope, our hope, is that there's a small but definite scale in terms of the dimension in our normalization, such that when we look at balls of that size or smaller, we'll observe interesting phenomena. The nicest thing would be if they're not just trivial, although that would be a meaningful assertion also, were it true, which it isn't. But we hope to see something, and we hope it's even better if it's interesting, non-trivial, and we can still describe it. So that's the hope on a small but definite scale. We know on a manifold if we go to a small enough scale, but we can't predict it in advance, then everything will look trivial. But we don't want to not be able to predict the scale. Having fixed these things, we want to be able to predict the scale on which it will look either trivial or sufficiently close to trivial that it's interesting and definite. Okay, so 
what we do is we just imagine that we take our small ball and look at it under a microscope. Or even better, we just take the whole manifold and rescale it once again. Okay? So now, our lower bound, as a consequence of the way Ricci's curvature scales, is almost zero. It's only slightly negative. And our small ball is now a ball of unit size. And our manifold, which might have been compact, let's say, with diameter one, now if epsilon is small, appears to the naked eye to be non-compact. So therefore, as far as we can tell, although it's not literally true, but we might be fooled into thinking, since our vision is only so good, that we are studying a, a ball of size one now in a complete non-compact manifold with Ricci curvature non-negative. Okay? Now this is, the intu this is the intuition, and this is a correct intuition. You, you could guess now that something good could come out of this, but we haven't done anything in the way of mathematics yet, so it's just the idea, right? So the rescaling idea is a very general idea, and yet it's, it's useful because it organizes what we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to do an experiment, so we look under a microscope at a small ball. But because we don't have an actual microscope and all possible examples, right, we have to, it, now what we're supposed to do is predict the results of that experiment. So now we know what experiment we're supposed to predict. So the reason why at this point we might hope that uh, to observe something interesting is that non-negative Ricci curvature, if it were actually true, tends to oppose non-compactness of the manifold. And now we've produced a situation that looks to us like we have non-negative Ricci and non-compact, although neither are quite true, but morally they're true. They're true to as good a degree of approximation as we want if we just agree to fix epsilon small enough. Okay, but at a certain point we're supposed to stop uh, and say that was enough. So it tends to oppose non-compactness. In fact, if the Ricci curvature has a definite positive lower bound, then the manifold must be compact by Meyer's theorem, as Jim taught me, and the diameter has a definite bound on it. So you include the fundamental group is finite and so on, the universal covering is compact. And so, in particular, this means that suppose we relax this to not strictly positive with a definite lower bound, but just non-negative, then of course we know we can have something like a parabola where uh, the compactness fails to be true, but still the situation should be constrained. If it fails, it should fail in some way that we can specify. We can specify the failure. And that phenomenon is what in this context is called rigidity. The situation is rigid, okay? The failures have some definite structure to them. And what we hope uh, is that if the situation appears to be rigid, right, but secretly isn't quite, that it should still resemble what would be literally true, what would be literally rigid. We shouldn't be able to tell that it's not rigid since we can't tell that the hypotheses don't hold. It should look rigid to us, even though it might not be upon closer inspection. So that's the idea. Okay, so what is the rigidity that's associated with complete non-compact manifolds with reaching non-negative? So recall the basic phenomenon is this one. The basic result is this one. So recall that a line is a doubly infinite geodesic, um, any finite segment of which is minimal. And so to say a non-compact manifold contains a line is saying not only is it non-compact, but non-compact in a rather strong sense. It's not true that any non-compact manifold contains a line. Okay? But if it's non-compact in a sufficiently strong sense and has reaching non-negative, which tends to oppose this non-compactness, then according to uh, an old theorem of Grimaud and myself, uh, which is, was a generalization of an earlier result for sectional curvature due to Topanagov, uh, who, who made this basic discovery, if the Ricci is non-negative and the manifold contains a line, this can only happen in the most trivial possible way, namely the line splits off as an isometric factor. Uh -huh. So it's obviously rigid. And of course, we see this can happen. I could start with any m bar n minus 1 of non-negative Ricci curvature and cross it with a line to obtain this situation. So it says that the trivial examples are the only examples. Okay. And this turns out um, to uh, be a basic result. Now, 
let me have an aside, a little bit of philosophy. Um, so, well, not just, not just yet. Maybe let me say first um, what I tried to say before. Let me repeat it about the idea of almost rigidity. So, how do we want to use this? So remember, before we were taking a small ball and rescaling it to unit size, okay? So now, I want what, what would play the role of something that would appear to us to be a line? Well, the most obvious thing would be, suppose I take a minimal geodesic segment of some definite length, okay, say two, for example. Now, after rescaling the metric, the length has gone from two to two times epsilon, two over epsilon, uh, which is long, right, if epsilon is small. So to us, this lo now looks like a line, okay? We can't see far enough, so we can't tell that it's not a line. So therefore, our hope is that the whole situation will behave uh, like um, a, a non-negative Ricci curved manifold, non-compact, which contains a line. This is a plausible intuition, right? So we could elevate this to a kind of metaphysical principle and say that that's what should happen in such circumstances. And therefore, what we would expect is that this manifold, if we look at our ball, for example, it will appear to split isometrically. Okay? It will look to us like it splits isometrically, even though if, since epsilon isn't zero, if we examine it with a sufficiently high resolving power, it might not look that way anymore. Right? But if our vision isn't too good, that's what will appear to happen. And a way to think of this, it's something like the geometry being differentiable, right? Because it means something like that. I mean, that, don't take that literally, but it means a kind of control in, of the geometry in the transverse direction, that it appears not to change. So it's a little bit like when a function is differentiable, you blow it up, and, and on the correct scale, it's, it's not uh, changing. Um, now, this intuition is true, and this actually is an extremely useful thing, but it's hard to prove. Um, it's hard to prove that it's true, and in particular, one thing that's necessary is to understand the precise sense in which it's going to be true. So it's not literally true, for example, with Ricci bounded below, um, that if you're in a sufficiently good case, it will be topologically a product that's known to be false. Um, the examples uh, initially due to Mike Anderson and later to Perelman, um, uh, which, which are even non-collapsed. Uh, so it's not going to be the case. No matter how small you take epsilon, you can find an example where the hypotheses are satisfied to that error, and, and still the topology contain an awful lot of handles, okay, as many as you like. Still, in some sense, very sparse, something like a set of measure zero, um, but but a lot of them nonetheless. Um, so you have to have the right sense in which it's going to be true. Now here's a bit of philosophy um, about what the significance of this might be and why you expect it to be a significant result in the geometry of, of these manifolds. In, when you're talking about a rigid situation, you're talking by definition about a situation that almost never occurs. Right, because it says the only example is the trivial example, so it almost never occurs. Um, and it would be just like a curiosity that says it's not interesting to study such a situation. Right, now you know you should go on to something else, except although it almost never occurs, actually sometimes it occurs anyway. Um, in other words, that there are hypotheses like having a compact manifold with non-trivial fundamental group, and then you look at the universal covering, which forced the existence of lines even though you didn't just uh, put them right in the hypothesis. So there are non-trivial hypotheses which lead to the existence of lines and that's why even the rigidity result exerts a, a certain strong control, at least in the appropriate situations, over the geometry. But yet, it's rare. Now by contrast, uh, because of the possibility of rescaling the situation, the almost rigidity is a much more pervasive kind of thing, right? Because uh, if I start with a geodesic of any definite length and rescale it sufficiently, then it looks like a line. So this is, by contrast, paradoxically extremely common. And even you could think that what it means in this case is that the geometry 
has a certain kind of self-regulating feature, right? Namely, if your manifold is not a point, then it has kind of at least one direction to it, right? So then it has a minimal segment of a definite length, which when blown up, uh, gives a line. That is, the minimal segment means that as you move along that, you look on a sufficiently small scale, the geometry looks like a product. Now, either that's the whole manifold, or you can go off transverse to uh, that segment. And then you get more directions and more lines on a suitable scale and so on. So in this sense, the splitting theorem uh, helps to regulate the geometry. It means that the more manifolds you have, the more splitting you have. Um, so this is the way I like to think of it. So the basic approach now is to try to study the small scale structure of these manifolds by the standard techniques of geometric analysis, um, meaning the way nonlinear PDE, like the minimal service equation, harmonic maps, and so on, are studied. And that involves certainly uh, scaling, as we saw from Blaine's talk, or we heard from Blaine's talk, from minimal services and so on, tangent cones. Uh, what you might call stability or epsilon regularity, namely, uh, how do you recognize when something looks like the standard situation. If you're trying to prove minimal surfaces don't have singularities, you have to have some weak hypothesis, which if it satisfies, tells you it looks completely standard. Um, and then you can use that to recognize the standard situation, which you hope will be the typical, although you can't expect it to be true everywhere. And then other uh, similar techniques are the notion of some kind of taking weak limits of things, like distributions or some kind of weak topology in which you will have compactness. And then statements to the effect that under certain circumstances, the weak convergence or compactness leads to a uh, weak convergence actually implies a stronger kind of convergence under additional hypotheses. Okay. Now, now let's come back to the specific situation that we're looking at and try to uh, get some feeling for what we might expect in the way of results. So it's important in this subject, uh, as could already be guessed from the bishop gromov inequality for pairs of balls, that it makes a big difference whether you add to your assumption on curvature the assumption that there's a definite a priori lower bound on the volume, which we'll think of as the non-collapse situation. That should be very strong because, after all, the fundamental thing that you, you have, the most primitive, is a comparison for pairs of volumes of balls. So this assumption that you're looking in addition uh, at something which uh, doesn't appear to be lower dimensional is a very strong one and you can stronger things are true in the so-called non-collapse case. In fact, if you looked at bounded curvature and sec two-sided bound on sectional or even somehow one-sided bound uh, and non-collapse situation uh, you would really reach the conclusion in that stronger situation that things looked rather standard on a small scale with a two-sided bound, literally so. Um, but here, it's not going to be the case that even if it's non-collapsed, no matter how small a scale you look at, you can still, at least at certain points, observe something interesting, okay? And the example that Blaine was talking about with the cone and the minimal services and so on is a good analogy to keep in mind, as we'll see, because there are in these different subjects many similarities that at their most fundamental probably have to do with scaling properties, but then you can study them by the same sorts of techniques provided you can implement the technique. So you need some hard result and in this case the almost rigidity is what allows you to implement the ideas. Okay, so let's look at the following specific example to give us some feeling about what we might expect. So you, there's a metric uh, called the aguchi hansen metric, which actually not only has Ricci bounded below, but Ricci identically zero. Um, so it's two-sided bounded, in fact, the bound is zero. On the tangent bundle to S2. Now, you don't have to know the formula for this metric. Uh, you just have to believe it exists and understand that it looks roughly as follows. So first of all, it has the symmetries that you would expect it to have, like the symmetries of the tangent bundle to the two-sphere. So, in particular, 
the zero section is totally geodesic, the fibers are rotationally symmetric, and um, at infinity it looks like R4 divided by the antipodal map. So the, tangent bun the unit tangent bundle to the two sphere is RP3, so that together with the radial direction gives me something that's topologically like R4 modulo the antipodal map, namely the cone on RP3 as opposed to S3, and the ge geometry at infinity just looks like it becomes asymptotic rather rapidly, very rapidly to that cone, like R2, the minus sixth or something. Okay. Now suppose we take one such manifold, then if there's one such metric, we know actually there's a whole family of such metrics because the condition reaches zero is invariant under scaling. So is the asymptotic geometry at infinity for that matter. So in particular, we could scale the metric down, right, in this particular case. If there were any negative curvature to begin with, that would blow it to minus infinity. But here, since the lower bound is zero, we can actually scale down. It's preserved. In fact, the curvature just stays zero. And whatever our S2 was, the zero section, now becomes extremely small. And the manifold appears to the naked eye like it's just the cone on RP3. And in the limit, uh, that's exactly what you get, a singular space with one isolated singular point, And the little two-sphere pops away. But if we don't go to the limit, then we see that the volume is bounded below because in the limit it's just this cone, which is a definite object. And the topology near that singular point is not going to be non-trivial for any epsilon you give me. I just scale it more, and I see a two-sphere on a smaller scale, which satisfies all these definite bounds. So I cannot expect everywhere, even a definite lower bound, and reach the identically zero to say if I go to a small enough scale, then everywhere I'll see nothing interesting. At least somewhere I'm going to see something interesting in certain examples. There's a souped up version of this by Perelman uh, who actually constructs a sequence of manifolds um, with bounded diameter, positive Ricci, uniform lower volume bound, and the second Betty number going to infinity. And so there's no even topological finiteness under these hypotheses, uh, which there would be, for example, if the sectional curvature had a two-sided bound. Um, so this gives some feeling about what to occur. We definitely can't expect to see the space being regular everywhere. On the other hand, even though there are many tiny handles, it's not what you see typically, if you think in the sense of measure. And um, <coughs> Uh, so what we could hope for is that uh, we, we, we will see some bad behavior but on a relatively thin set and in most places the behavior should be nice and this is in the spirit of partial regularity theories for non-elliptic PDE and in particular for what happens uh, with uh, Jim's comb, right, which is a stable minimal surface which has an isolated singularity but the singularity has high co-dimension. So this is the kind of feeling that um, one should have about the subject and if you went to the limit in Perelman's examples what you get actually it so happens in this case is a topological manifold S4 with an embedded S1 of singular points which is a singular set on this limit space here I'm not being precise about the limit I'll say that in a second so this, it has a singular set in this limiting example the singular set is in this case of co-dimension 3 okay so Here's a more general statement that we'll see uh, shortly a picture that illustrates, and it's the following thing, so I'm making a little imprecise intentionally. So here's, here's, here's the idea that if um, we look at any manifold with a definite lower bound on Ricci, say that of hyperbolic space, and assume also a definite lower bound on the volume of a unit ball, right? So then that gives us some lower bound everywhere, even as we move away from it. Then we go to a sufficiently small scale, all sufficiently small handles that we find, topological non-triviality, non, the topological non-triviality is concentrated near a set of co-dimension two. Okay. So it's rather thin, not just measure zero somehow, but even lower dimensional in the sense of Hausdorff content. Uh, so this is like a kind of partial regularity result. And, uh, for instance, in the Aguchi-Hansen case, the non-triviality was concentrated near a set of co-dimension four, but 
uh, in general, uh, we don't know that that's the case. Um, but we can prove a result like this one, and I'll restate it presently in a form that will look even more precise, uh, although a slightly different kind of restatement. Now, in order to prove something like that, as I indicated earlier, that prove that the bad region, where you have tiny topological uh, non-triviality, uh, is thin, you have to have some way of recognizing the good region, right? So this is what's called in PDE an epsilon regularity theorem. And the relevant one here is the assertion that if we have a ball whose volume is not only just definite bounded below, but moreover, almost as big as it could possibly be. So by comparison, uh, it could only be as big as that in the model space with the lower bound. So once we get sufficiently close where epsilon depends only on the dimension n, then essentially this looks like a standard ball. Of course, we can't literally say it's standard near the boundary, but if you change the boundary slightly, it looks like a topological ball, and you can even find a by hurlder parameterization, conceivably, eventually, by Lipschitz, although we don't by any means know that. It's much harder technically. But it looks topologically and in this sense even metrically standard, a ball which has almost maximal volume. And this then allows you, uh, I mean, volume is a much weaker thing to control, and this is the tool for recognizing balls that are standard in a stronger sense, provided they're standard in a weak sense. Okay, so this is again really a kind of stability or almost rigidity theorem, and again, it's not easy to prove. Um, but that's the tool that you use. Okay, so now let me make, to try to say things more precisely, a kind of technical aside. So I've used the phrase several times, uh, something looks to the naked eye like something else, right? So what does that really mean? So this was the notion of Hausdorff distance of a subset, but made abstract by Gromo. It's a very soft general notion and extremely uh, useful, especially for organizing things. So it's just the idea if I have two compact metric spaces, so first of all, consider the compact metric spaces. Then the natural thing, when I say they look the same to the naked eye, their distance in the gromov hausdorff sense is less than epsilon, right? I say I have a map from x to y, which almost preserves the distances. The distances between points and their images is negligibly small. Well, negligible meaning epsilon is how negligible, right? Now this map is not, and moreover, the range is epsilon dense. So when I say it this way, it appears to be asymmetrical, but this is a convenient way of thinking about it. Since I don't require any continuity at all of the map, and since the range is epsilon dense, I can easily construct a map in the opposite direction, maybe with three epsilon or something like that. So it's an essentially symmetrical condition. You can formulate it in a slightly more abstract way that makes it perfectly symmetrical. And this is, so on the large scale, uh, the spaces look like they're the same metric space. They look isometric. You look with a microscope, there's no relation at all. As long as you look on a much smaller scale than epsilon, it's not saying anything, but if it's the distance between the points was large with respect to epsilon, then it looks like it's the same in both spaces. So this is a very interesting notion of when two metric spaces are close and a very appropriate one, particularly in the context of Ricci curvature. Now for us, a seemingly technical generalization is also extremely important, and that is when the spaces are non-compact, this would literally be too strong to be useful, but we could think of this as defining a notion of convergence for sequences of metric spaces to some limit metric space. Then for non-compact space, spaces, the appropriate notion would just be to say we had like uniform convergence on compact subsets. So if you go further out in the sequence, bigger and bigger balls look indistinguishable from the ball in the limit. The closer you go, the bigger ball. So it's like with functions, uniform convergence on compact subsets. So that, as you'll see, that technical generalization is extremely important for what we want to do. Okay, now once having said this notion, there's a very important result, particularly important for Ricci curvature. And it says that if I consider all the manifolds with a definite upper bound on the diameter, 
definite lower bound on the Ricci curvature and nothing else, that set as a collection of metric spaces is pre-compact with respect to this distance. That is, every sequence of infinite sequence of manifolds satisfying just these two bounds, which are very weak, right, has a convergent subsequence, has a Cauchy subsequence with respect to this gromov hausdorff metric. And that means after passing to a subsequence, there's some limit object, which is, of course, no longer a Riemannian manifold. It's some kind of singular limit of Riemannian manifolds. But what this says is it makes sense to take those singular limits, okay? Just as when you study functions, it's extremely useful to be able to talk about Sobolev spaces or distributions, some kind of singular generalization of the objects, because it allows you to split, to organize your discussion. So just saying that these limits exist sometimes uh, gets you somewhere and sometimes just kind of to tells you what you're supposed to prove. But it's definitely important, although this is a soft, general, elementary result. Um, it only, uh, but nonetheless, it's very powerful in organizing the discussion and uh, at various stages. So what it says in our context is that if we wanted to study how our manifolds look like on a small scale, certainly a relevant thing to do would be to pass to the limit and study what kind of limit spaces you can get. Now, of course, the only thing you know about the limit spaces, in effect, is that they're limits of your manifolds. So you have to, so to say, pass back and forth. You wouldn't know anything about the limit spaces without some kind of uniform estimates on the manifolds. But still, you can translate if you know that, you can translate it into something about the limits, kind of go further and then go back. So the ability to pass back and forth and have equivalent formulations in this sense is extremely useful. Okay. So it makes sense now literally always to take limits and get singular spaces and study their properties. The limits of Riemannian manifolds is the definition. It's very elementary. Right? So a priori, we don't have any idea what they look like. The only thing we know about them, it's very easy to see that it's still true that for any pair of paths, there's a minimal geodesic connecting them because that easily passes to this kind of limit. And it's also true that given an epsilon dense, there, there's for any epsilon, an epsilon dense set with a definite number of members in it. In fact, that was a, a standard consequence of this bishop Gromov or doubling condition and this is just all that you use to show that you can take limits in this sense. So this, is, this condition is really kind of necessary and sufficient for taking limits, and it just comes from the doubling condition on, on the measure in a standard elementary argument. Okay, but so now if we want to change our point of view, um, we can take these limits, but we don't know anything about them yet. But from now on, I'll say that that's my point of view, and I want to study the structure of the limits. So now, the result that I stated earlier about the small handles has a reformulation as something about the limit spaces. So here is a basic result about what these non-collapsed limits can look like, okay, without saying yet what goes into uh, proving it. So, Consider one of these weak limits, and suppose it's non-collapsed, that is the volumes of uh, base points, uh, unit balls around base points, in your sequence have a definite uniform lower bound. Well, then the, what I claim is that there's an open set, there's this little parameter, epsilon, uh, that you have to put in, which you can ignore if you don't like it, it's just some small positive number, uh, or maybe I'll say what it is. So. Uh, there's like a regular part of this manifold, it's at least topologically regular, uh, of this space, of this singular metric space. So it was just a completely unknown space, but now what I claim is that almost everywhere it's actually a topological manifold. In fact, it's by Herder to a Riemannian manifold, conceivably by Lipschitz, although we don't know that. And this regular part is actually connected. And the singular part, the complement of this part, has co-dimension two, Hausdorff co-dimension two. So, so this is an equivalent formulation and a precise formulation to the statement I made before about the topology being concentrated in co-dimension two. And the simplest possible picture that you could draw actually shows that there's something to this. At least there's something to it. Um, so imagine something like an ice cream cone 
which over here as the limit you, you round it off with some sandpaper so I mean the surface of the object it's two-dimensional you round off the singularity with some sandpaper and the limit of such a process you go back to the singular point the curvature after the rounding off is highly positive near the singular point but it's not at all negative right you can do this keeping the curvature positive so it definitely has a lower bound although the lower bound is going to plus infinity and in the limit you get the space which is smooth everywhere except at this isolated singular point and that's co-dimension two and so this illustrates that this is what can happen and now I'm saying that uh, essentially this is what happens in general now if you have a convex surface of course it can look uh, a little bit more complicated it could have a dense set of kind of conical points on it which got weaker and weaker so in particular you could have kind of regular points, points where the tangent space was really a plane which were a limit of conical points with weaker and weaker conical singularities so that's the reason why I have to put in the epsilon so the epsilon includes some very weakly conical points which however are topologically regular it turns out and then I get an open set otherwise the regular part wouldn't be open mm -hmm. now you might also imagine what you would get if you took two spherical caps that were smaller than hemispheres and glued them together and then you got an edge right something that looks like an edge you know, I think well I made a mistake but as far as I understand I didn't make a mistake <laughs> because the reason is if you imagine then rescaling the picture around that edge when you rescale it it just looks more and more like two half spaces glued together you rescale it and the curvature of the edge goes to to zero so in my sense that's not a singular point the edge is all regular points the thing is by, by Lipschitz to uh, a, just a Euclidean space actually near that edge right so those are not on a singular point you really need something that's like a cone so now moreover we assume the volume was bounded below and now what I claim is there's a reasonable notion of convergence of the measures I mean if a sequence of points converges to a point on the limit space and the radii is fixed so that balls converge to a ball on the limit then the volumes it turns out will converge to the Hausdorff measure with the appropriate normalization of the corresponding ball on the limit so bounded volume bounded below means the volumes actually converge to Hausdorff measure on the limit which is an honest n-dimensional object um, okay and this is important the volume convergence is extremely uh, important from a technical standpoint and this allows you to go from the statement about the limit space to what happened when you approach the limit so the limit was only a limit in the weak sense right so it could be even as we approach the regular part of the limit there were tiny tiny handles on the manifold itself which popped off in the limit now our interest was in the manifold itself so I want to be sure that that's not happening but using the volume convergence and the epsilon regularity you can see that on the regular part as I approach the regular part of the limit the weak convergence is actually strong and topological convergence and therefore knowing this about the limit tells you about what happened prior to it and then the compactness says that you have this situation that I described before for the manifolds themselves so okay when we look at the limit spaces since now we don't know that they're manifolds anymore we want to study them by tangent cone analysis just as in the case of minimal varieties so that means and so this would we would like to know that most places there's a tangent cone and it's just Euclidean space and even along the singular set we would like to know what the infinitesimally the singularities look like so along this co-dimension two singular set so this is why we need the non-compact notion of gromov hausdorff convergence the pointed notion because we want to blow our space up having fixed a base point and take a limit which is a non-compact space and that's our notion of tangent cone at that point it captures the infinitesimal geometry at that point right. so we can do this whether the space is collapsed or not because by gromov's theorem we can take these kind of weak limits and we call that a tangent cone and 
Now we want to study what can the tangent cones look like. So our expectation, especially from what I've said so far, is that most of them should be a Euclidean space. Um, but some of them might not be, and what can they be, and, and so on. At the singular points, they should give us an infinitesimal picture of the singularity. Now, this kind of tangent cone analysis, why is this going to be useful? Why, don't we, why are we just not passing from one unknown situation, our space, to another unknown situation, our blown up space? Well, the reason is that morally the limit spaces had Ricci bounded below because there were limits of spaces with Ricci bounded below and therefore the blown up spaces morally have Ricci non-negative. And so the point is that it turns out that uh, the generalization, particular of the splitting theorem, the quantitative generalization which I alluded to earlier has an equivalent formulation that if I have a limit space, as these will be, any tangent cone will be, where the Ricci not only has a lower bound, but the lower bound tends to zero as you approach the limit, then the splitting theorem, which Gromol and I proved for smooth manifolds, and Tapanago for smooth with non-negative sectional curvature, actually holds for such singular spaces with the Ricci um, non-negative in this generalized sense. And therefore, I know a definite theorem that I can apply to tangent cones. They improve. They're nicer than the situation that I started out with. And now I could imagine doing it again, starting in a tangent cone and blowing it up again and eventually getting to a situation that looked like a Euclidean space and then seeing what that process meant for the space that I started with, right? So this is kind of iterated tangent cone analysis where you have some theorem that tells you the situation improves when you pass to a tangent cone. So let me just record what I said earlier. So this applies, yes. yeah? So the, the tangent cone is not a cone. Oh, well, I didn't get to that yet. So, so far, when I call it a cone, you just said, what? I mean, that you can do it again. Well, I can do it again. So iterated tangent cones uh, are, are limit spaces of this type. And they will have Ricci bounded below in this generalized sense. But so far, it's just a definition. The word cone shouldn't be taken literally yet, but I'll come back to that, right? It's just something I call the cone, right? The blow up limit, okay? So, uh, so I want to record the fact that a tool that I'll use and apply to these tangent cones is the fact that the splitting theorem has a quantitative generalization, which when I look at the limiting version says literally that the splitting theorem holds for uh, tangent cones with, uh, for spaces with Ricci curvature non-negative in this generalized sense, namely limits where the lower bound tends to zero, weak limits where the lower bound tends to, to zero. Um, this strengthens an earlier fundamental of Abrash and Grimal, the so-called abrash grimal inequality, which was the first general statement where you showed that in an approximately rigid situation, you can estimate distances, um, not just volumes, in the context of Ricci curvature. So this incorporates their result and uh, builds on it. So as I mentioned, and uh, to answer, to come back again to Dennis's question, the existence of tangent cones does not require the non-collapsing condition. Any space, the fact that they have non-negative sectional curvature and so on, has tangent cones, and uh, they have generalized non-negative Ricci curvature. However, uh, something actually can be shown to be true about tangent cones in the non-collapse case. And this goes back to this bishop Bromo monotonicity of the volume. Uh, namely, they actually are metric cones on some possibly singular cross-section. The cross-section you should think of as having morally reached curvature bigger than that of the unit sphere. In particular, the cross-sections will have diameter at most pi. They will be connected with diameter most pi. In the non-collapse case, even at the singular points, when you blow the space up, you get some kind of cone, which conceivably, examples show, might not be unique. It might vary depending on how you blow it up at that point, even if it's very close to being Euclidean. And this is a corresponding almost rigidity theorem because you can see, it should have been in a way emphasized earlier, that morally the volume behaves like a cone in this case. And the almost rigidity, and it's known in the smooth case, if the volume behaves like a cone, 
reach is non-negative, it must be a cone. And uh, here is the corresponding, this bears the same relation to the splitting theorem on the previous transparency. There's a corresponding almost rigidity theorem having to do with uh, volume cone implies metric cone, right? So here's a picture, again, in two dimensions, the previous example, which shows that we can have a singular point, we have a tangent cone, which is just what we think it is, and it looks like a cone. Um, and it's a cone of positive curvature, that is the cross section, the circle, which the cross section has a length less than 2 pi, as opposed to possibly less than or equal to 2 pi, less than if it's singular. And it can't, in our case, have circumference greater than 2 pi, although um, I can certainly consider such cones. So a metric cone is just what you think it is, a cone of arbitrary cross-section, and here the cross-section isn't completely arbitrary. So let me close by just saying a word about what happens in the non-collapse case if you throw away the lower bound on volume. Then it turns out there's a dichotomy. So if the volume goes to zero, then the limit space is literally lower dimensional. This is if and only if, and in fact the dimension is, can be shown to be less than n minus one, so there's a gap. It's not known that the dimension of such a limit space is always an integer, although one might uh, conjecture that. Now, what can you say in the collapse case? We don't know nearly as much as in the non-collapse case. Um, in fact, we don't know that there are any topological manifold points at all in the collapse case, but it turns out that there's another point of view where the situation uh, it looks uh, extremely uh, nice and reasonable, although the topological aspects of it uh, are yet to be uncovered. So, first of all, the collapse case meant the volume just went to zero, so that's bad, but there's a simple procedure suggested by Fukaya, namely the most obvious thing, you renormalize it by dividing by the volume of the unit ball, and now the, the renormalized volumes you can easily show using, for example, bishop Gromov. it's like the compactness of probability measures on a fixed base, converge to something. In the non-collapse case, without need for renormalization, they converge to uh, actual Hausdorff measure. So on these collapsed limit spaces, there are natural measures, which might depend on the sequence and not just on the limit space. So an interval can be the limit, for example, of uh, thin cylinders or thin needles. In one case, I get Lebesgue measure. In another case, I get integration of R by dr. The measure isn't unique. Therefore, it depends on the sequence and not just the limit space. If it were a Hausdorff measure, that would just depend on the metric structure of the limit space. But this is not all bad because it says that the metric structure encodes something about the collapsing sequence. Moreover, it turns out that there is a unique measure class that doesn't depend on all these renormalized measures have the same notion of sets of measure zero. And then, with respect to this notion of measure zero, it turns out that the singular set on the limit space, infinitesimally singular, is of measure zero. That is, a singular point is one, a regular point infinitesimally is one where every tangent cone is a Euclidean space. The singular set turns out to have measure zero, so this is at least something in the collapse case. We don't know that the, near the singular points, the manifold actually looks like the tangent, near the regular points, actually looks like the tangent cone. So topologically, we don't understand them. So the last thing I want to say is, nonetheless, there is a nice description of what things look like in the collapse case if we throw away our idea that we have to understand the topology. And then they look like uh, standard mathematical objects, the abstract versions thereof, right? So, and this description, because it's by, it's, it's by Lipschitz, but only measurable, is actually important even in the non-collapse case, where we had topological, but only by Herder. So, from the point of view of analysis, by Lipschitz. So, what I'm saying is, even in the collapse case, these limit spaces are what are called rectifiable varifolds if they were subsets. So namely, you can break them up into a countable union of measurable sets, and what's left over has measure zero. Unfortunately, we don't know, k is the dimension here, and we don't know that it's the same, even if it was the li limit of connected spaces. But allowing for that possibility, it's a countable union of nice pieces, 
off a set of measure zero, and nice means that the pieces are by Lipschitz to a subset of Rn, even with constant extremely close to one by refining it further. So it's, it's a countable union of measurable subsets. If you think a measurable subset looks almost like an open set, which it does in some measure theoretic sense, namely at the density points, then it's a countable union again of pieces of Rn. They're just not open, but for many purposes this is fine. And it puts them in the context of standard mathematical objects, which arise in this new way. And as a, context, a consequence of this by Lipschitz description, it turns out that one can define on the limit space as a natural Laplace operator, which is self-adjoint with the compact inverse if the space is compact. And therefore, these spaces have, an inf have, have eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, which can be defined without reference to the fact that they arise as limit spaces, but just because of the structure that you prove that they have. And then the last thing that I'll mention is, if you now remember that they are limit spaces, so this is like an application that shows that this measurable decomposition is useful. If you now remember that they are limit spaces and therefore are limits of spaces with eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, it turns out that you can show that the spectrum converges to the spectrum on the limit space, eigenvalue by eigenvalue, and the eigenfunctions converge to the eigenfunctions on the limit space. This had been conjectured by Fukaya in the paper I mentioned earlier, who proved it for bounded sectional curvature where you have uh, much, much stronger properties available and by a completely different method. But here, even though we know, don't know about manifold points or anything like that, we know enough to prove some definite statements like these. Okay, so thank you very much. Holder, by holder. Yes. Do you suspect it may not be true that you can take it Lipschitz hold alpha equals one? Well, this is, yeah, it might not be true. This is known to be a very hard, I mean, this kind of refined distinction. So, so there are other contexts where you it, can it, prove it, analogous it results. True. Yeah. You know, holder is like f of x plus h equals h to the one alpha that you place alpha by one. Yeah. Is there any chance it could be h squared times square root log one over h? Well, I've never considered something so refined. That. Okay. Think about that one instead of H. Okay. There are other contexts in analysis where you have by Lipschitz, by Lipschitz with any alpha and a kind of decomposition like this one, and yet it's known to be very hard to get Hurler. It's not known in analogous context. So it's known that this is, at least at this stage, a hard problem. And I never thought yet about such a more refined uh, result. What was the more refined because condition? Try h times square root log one over h. Uh, h times square root what? Log one over h. Yeah, Just so check it out and see if there's any chance it might work. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't have any idea yet how to, uh, how to prove it, but one could think about it or try to. Any other questions? Let's thank the speaker again.